Test, 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 test. Good deal. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Stack and Beyond Analysis Paralysis. My name is Nikki Acosta. I'm the co-host of OS Pod. Used to be called OpenStack Pod, but apparently that is a trademark violation. Uh, I also am a cloud evangelist now at Cisco. And I'm really excited about my panel today. Since we submitted, we've had a, a couple of uh, find and replace options, but great group of folks. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. My name is Jeremiah Dooley. I'm one of the principal architects at SolidFire, uh, one of the, the sponsoring Cinder storage providers here. And I believe this is my seventh OpenStack conference, so it's fun to, uh, fun to see the progression from year to year. Perfect. Hi, my name is Shamal Tahir. I'm with IBM. I work on IBM Private Cloud as an offering manager. And within the community, I'm really involved with uh, the product working group, the enterprise working group, as well as a newly launched initiative called Super User TV to get operators in front of the OpenStack community in a, in, in a broader sense from a video perspective. Hello, everyone. My name is Andre Barefield. Um, I work with Blue Box, uh, recently acquired by IBM. Um, so Shamal and I are recently became teammates, which was not the case when I think with this talk was submitted. Um, but I work on the, uh, uh, on the product side, um, from the instantiation through the acquisition of the Blue Box Cloud, private cloud as a service uh, product. Thank you, my panelists. You guys are awesome. Good looking panel too. So diverse. Uh, Shamel, you are part of the product working group and I saw the email that went out this morning or yesterday morning about the product roadmap. Can you tell the folks in the room what the product working group is and what your group is working on? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very relevant to this topic actually. So the product working group is a community working group where what we're doing is we're working with the user committee and the user committee is defined by end users and operators. So Subu from PayPal is, is the chair. Uh, we have um, John Perlow from MIT, and we just got Sheila Sabi from Comcast, who's in the user committee as well. So we work on the user committee's behalf. Within the user committee, we have different groups that represent different market interests, so enterprise users, telco users, HPC users. And what the product working group is doing is taking requirements in the form of user stories from all those different working groups that represent different markets and voices of customers and getting them into a format where we can turn them into sp actionable specs, blueprints, and share them with the project teams. And generally what we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver things that are you know, cross-project, multi-release, the big rocks, if you will. So rolling upgrades was one that we're chasing right now. We're looking at lifecycle management uh, as another one. So uh, you know, really focus on getting the voice of the customers and operators and, and open stack consumers back into the development process is the bigger focus of what the product working group does. We are also generating a multi-release roadmap view. So what we're doing is as we're communicating and working with the PCLs, we're asking them, what are you working on this release? Cool, what are you working on the next release? Okay, we're pushing the boundaries, but what are you working on next release? So we'll, we'll, we'll ask them the, about 18 months worth of where are you going? And that data is available in, in the roadmap format on openstack.org now. But the cool thing is as you're planning for different technologies, as an operator, you can see where OpenStack is going and be able to plan a little bit better, hopefully. So are, are folks like, uh, do they not like you guys because you're, <laughs> cause you're, and gals because you're driving these requirements or are they, are they pretty? So driving is a bad word, we don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, uh, but yeah, no, so in the beginning there was some tension, especially because, yeah, it was that, uh, it was a concept where people were thinking that, okay, as product managers, we're going to say, oh, this is what you need to do and go do it without any resourcing. We're just going to throw requirements, if you will, over the fence. And we were very clear and we've, it, you know, we've been around for a year now, but we've been engaging like every month with PTLs, the technical committee, cross project teams, just to ensure that if we turn user stories into requirements that we're going to bring back into the community from a development perspective, we will make sure that we have development resources that are willing to work as SMEs on those deliverables as well. So it's not just requirements, it's actually requirements, but then a lot of the product working group, people are, you know, companies like Cisco, IBM, HP, et cetera, and we're saying that we have development resources that we're willing to align with these user stories that are coming in as well. As far as the Project Navigator, which uh, was announced yesterday, where it shows the maturity of all the various projects, the adoption rates, all that good stuff, is that something that that group is also working on? So actually, that's interesting. So we weren't working on originally. Uh, originally, it's actually the Project Navigator is related more to the tags works. There's two types of tags. There's the TC-oriented tags and there's operator tags. So as OpenStack users, people want to know, okay, what percentage of this project, Nova, how many people have adopted this project in production? 
And that data is really useful to figure out like how mature a service is. So originally that was a purpose, but as we're building roadmap views of projects, we're actually in conversation with the Project Navigator team now to take the roadmap data we're building and make that visible through Project Navigator. So, and, and maybe this is a question for all of you. Uh, what are some of the requests that are coming down now that we've sort of reached critical mass and sort of OpenStack has won the open source cloud war, if you will? What are some of the requirements that you're hearing from users? How are they managing through all of the different vendor options versus open source options versus, you know, what they're trying to roll on their own? Like, what are, what are the challenges there? Uh, there are a thousand, a thousand times a thousand, <laughs> million times a million. There are so many options. I think that one of the greatest challenges is that, um, you know, there are new technologies being developed always. And so there are always new options and new ways to approach um, how infrastructure is being deployed, um, how infrastructure life cycles are being managed, um, the interaction between storage and compute and, you know, what the back, what sort of backends can be used and how, uh, just different ways to abstract away the physical uh, machines from what's being consumed by the user. And I think that um, it's really challenging to build a product that's compelling um, in a market where everything that lives just above this product is uh, in, in constant, uh, you know, constant state of change. Yeah, well, and it's almost like we've gone backwards, right? I mean, when we look at OpenStack three years ago, it was a disaster to install. It was uh, trying to figure out how to get from I want this to I can provision capacity was such an immense undertaking. And we spent all this time and all of these resources to simplify that process, right? Whether that was the consolidation of the distributions, whether that was just making the product itself better, whether that was pouring resources into the things that we knew customers were using, all of this stuff went into making OpenStack usable, installable, um, make it something that could win where we needed it to win from an application standpoint. But then, once we finally almost, mostly, <laughs> got to the point where that was the case, then we took the other side of the equal sign, which was the actual projects themselves, and just blew it wide open. So everything that we learned, we're now trying to do at a scale that the tools we use to make the core of OpenStack better, at least in my opinion, don't look like they're taking a whole lot of hold or have a whole lot of chance when we start increasing the number of projects. And there's, there's the natural issue of competing projects and which of these, when we need a navigator, mm -hmm. right, when we have to have a dashboard to show us which of these projects do what and how long and by who, it, it's, it's as much a sign of the issue as it is trying to solve the problem. Yeah. So it's not just, um, like the more, the more telemetry we have, the better. Right, I mean, the more telemetry we have about the projects and where they're going and what their relative maturity is, none of that is a bad thing, but the amount of effort that it's going to take to keep up with that in order to maintain the simplicity that we worked so long to get to from an OpenStack deployment standpoint, um, I think it still remains to be seen whether that's even a viable path to go down. So, so what happens at that point? Does, does, the, does the market find winners and then, you know, acquisitions happen and the losers become losers and they go away or at what point is OpenStack too big for any you know one company even at what point does it become too overwhelming to to be considered as a viable option for adoption yeah, see and I think that this is th what Jeremiah said and what, you, what you're asking right now are th I think are the things that lead to the analysis process because at the end of the day, OpenStack has services and we're adding more services, but then we have things like Docker Swarm, we have Mesos, we have Kubernetes, we have Cloud Foundry. Do we integrate with those ecosystems or do we need to provide those services ourselves? Like basically, what's OpenStack's role in the bigger layer cake of the data center, if you will? And I think that is something we need to really have a vision and definition around to be able to then say, okay, this, enhancing this and adding projects here is cool, adding things here, yeah, maybe we're, we're inventing things that we don't need to invent. Right. Uh, one of the, the things that I've, that I've heard uh, folks say in terms of the scope and size, especially on the user end, is that networking continues to be a challenge. Why do you think that is? It's the hardest part, I think, you know. I think the way computers communicate and then virtual resources communicate and then the, uh, trying to uh, Trying to manage manage that in an automatable way is just yeah. 
very, it's just the most complex piece. Oh, but yeah. one of the things we learned even just yesterday is that Neutron has more commits in this cycle yeah. than it has in the history of, sure. um, of the existence of OpenStack. Well, so I think that... And I think of all the silos, right? Of all, uh, we spent the last 20 years breaking everything out into silos. I think nowhere does that show more than in the complete failure of getting networking on board the same way we've gotten everything else on board, mm -hmm. right? And some of that is that it's hard, and some of that is that from a data center standpoint, so many of us who come from an infrastructure background, we just abdicated all of the networking out. And mm -hmm. as long as I could get from point A to point B, good job, I'm gonna keep doing the things that I wanna yep. do. Yep. Um, and, I, and I think that you know it's only been the last couple of years where we've realized if we actually want to integrate that from top to bottom, the, you know, the networking teams and the networking experience needs to be something that's a full-fledged member at the table. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it'll stay, I don't know that it'll stay kind of the, the, you know, the rear echelon forever. Right? I mean, we know how to make that work. It's just a matter of getting it into a usable, con, you know, a user consumable format. But, uh, you know, I, don't, I, I think that the state of software defined networking in general is one of the biggest indictments of the, the siloing of IT technologies kind of yeah. in general. So, two points I want to make on networking as well are one, um, it's interesting because, you know, in Kyle Mestri's keynote, he kind of showed that, okay, we, and, and Jonathan, and everyone's kind of have, has been telling this message of, one platform for VMs, containers, and bare metal. And then when Kyle was presenting, he said, oh, and by the way, networking crosses all of those. So A, it's such an integral part of any, mm -hmm. whether you're using VMs or, or bare metal or containers, that it's always top of mind. So it's almost like, uh, you know, at one point, Honda was the most stolen car in the world. And it wasn't because, you know, if people wanted Hondas. It was there were so many of them that they just became, by volume, the most stolen. And I think networking is one of those things that it's so needed and it's such a necessity that if there's issues in that layer, they surface really fast because everyone's using it. One, one of the things that, that kind of struck me, and I, I've heard this a few times uh, in the last few months from Jonathan Bryce, was that uh, he's referring to OpenStack not as an open source cloud software platform. It's an integration engine. Do, do you agree that that's what OpenStack should be? How far, how far up the stack? Should we say, okay, here's, here's where OpenStack's gonna live and, and the rest is what it is? I don't think there's any choice anymore. I mean, I, I think that when you've introduced so many variables, I mean, when you've got millions upon millions of different pieces that you could plug in there, the hard part is not the individual pieces, it's the integration, right? It's easy to make a Lego. It is hard to build something that you thought about using the Legos that you have in front of you. Like that, the integration becomes the only part of that that is, um, that is useful, particularly when there are so many people working on so many projects that you know, we, we can pick and choose the pieces that we want out of there, but putting all of them together, the only thing that sits in the middle of that is the OpenStack Foundation, right? I mean, it's, it's the only glue that sits in the middle there, and at some point, all the rest of it just becomes window dressing, right? It becomes a navigator to see who's working on what and where in the marketplace can I go to get which piece to put it together. But how all of those work together and get patched and upgraded and how they work with different networking technologies, that level of integration, I don't know that that can be optional. Yeah, I think it's very apt. I think that um, kind of what we're talking about here, all these options, all these different ways to do things. Um, I think that um, when if you think about the technology that we're building, we're developing with OpenStack, and expecting that at some point it's going to settle in to a done state, it's, it's, it's uh, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what we're seeing is these, all these pioneers having more ability to build infrastructure and build their ideas. OpenStack enables that, that sort of uh, fertile land. And I think that where we actually have to settle in is um, knowing that all these things will continue to change and new technology will continue to, to, to flourish. Which makes it really hard to manage a product based on OpenStack. Absolutely. Well, but, <laughs> but what will happen, what will happen is that, that that work of deciding who wins, that work of deciding how things integrate, will move to the next level up the stack, which is the system in integrators. Right? And from a solid fire standpoint, um, you know, what we brought to the table was the most programmatic storage platform that we possibly could that did everything Cinder could uh, you know, out of, out of a block storage platform. And so when we talk to integrators, what they're doing is they're deciding on behalf of their customers, right? And when we work with Mirantis or when we work with Cisco or we work with, um, you know, IBM or any of these other groups, what, what we see happening is that there's somebody internally 
right, who's building one of these products that then gets sold to customers who's saying, you're going to get A, B, purple, blue, and green. And I'm going to put those together and that's going to be the product that you get. And now there's a middleman between, you know, kind of the, the fertile ground on one hand and, you know, wh what, what vegetables are we taking home in the middle, which is both good and bad, right? I mean, it's good because it makes it far more consumable for the end user. It's bad because there are probably seven different options that they could have used that may have been better, that may have worked more, that are being decided largely by the bias of whoever is managing that product inside the, the, the systems integrator. Um, so uh, to, be, to be real about it, the end user is still going to get what the end user gets. Right. The question is, is that something they're going to be get that you know, something that they're going to get that's pure OpenStack, or is that something they're going to get as a prepackaged appliance from Cisco, or as a prepackaged solution from Mirantis? Right. And I don't know that it's a bad thing. It's OpenStack. It works. It solves the need that the customer has. But um, all of the all of that fertile ground for innovation, I think, it becomes a lot harder to convince people to start pushing into there when what you actually need to do is figure out a way to get IBM to support that product or project or Cisco to support that project. Which seems so contrary to the premise of wh on which OpenStack was built. It was like choice, no vendor, lock-in. But ultimately, <laughs> is it all going back to the vendors at this point? Well, uh, somebody's got to make money, <laughs> right? I mean, somebody, somebody has to put this together and then make money off of delivering it to customers who use it to support workloads. Right? I guess and I kind of disagree with you. I think it's. I think it goes down. It it all. It will always land in the hands of the users, and I think that the user will always demand the system integrator, the 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 big businesses that that are paying or putting their resources to these projects will demand that we line up in an in an area where we can support what they want to do. I think the the. I think Docker is a. I hate. This is not a container talk, but. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a great example of where users and really treating the developer as the first class citizen um, and the, the person who will ultimately need to consume the technology and watching the way that changes the direction of an entire community of people yeah. and how we approach uh, the way we build cloud technology. Then, let, then let's meet in the middle, let's say yeah. some users, yeah. right? Because there are obviously mm -hmm. many strata of OpenStack consumers oh, sure. and they're always going to be the guys who stand on stage at a keynote who are very much vested in both an ecosystem and a series of, of uh, or a set of functionality that they have to have. And they're always going to be, they're going to be voting with developer bodies and with alignment to vendors. But the 80% of the customers who are going to be consuming OpenStack, I mean, they, they wouldn't know what to do with the, with the navigator. Right? I mean, they have workloads and they have an internal operational process and they want to be able to support those workloads and OpenStack is the way that they have chosen to do that or the platform that best does that for them. And I don't think, I don't think the vast majority of those consumers are going to have the time or the inclination to invest that much into what the direction is and where it's going. They have, you know, there's five things I need out of this platform, go. And who's not hiring? I mean, everyone's desperately short on talent at this point, right? Yeah. How many product folks do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Just a few. How many times does someone come to you and say, hey, I want your flavor of OpenStack, but I need you to support this inter your legacy storage or, you know. Every single time you talk to a customer. And, and what do you do? <laughs> like as a, as a product manager, what do you say to that? Like do you tell, you know, I see this like uh, continual struggle between product and sales where sales is like, hey, in order for me to close this deal, I need you to support this cinder driver for this particular storage option, pure, nimble, you know, whatever it is. Um, and another, on the other hand, if you spent all your time certifying all the possible Cinder drivers that were out there, all you, 70 of them. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to progress forward. And what I've learned too, and I'll use storage, I'll pick on storage for a little bit, is that uh, some of these vendors will certify on a specific version of OpenStack but there might not be any backwards compatibility with past releases and they may not be ready to release for the next release. And so those are all moving targets too. So, you know, w what are your options at that point? I mean, other than, you know, choose solid fire. Yeah. No, well, it's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <Don't you care>? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that doesn't, but it doesn't change, it doesn't change the math, right? It doesn't change the math. And that's where we see 
the systems integrators, right? The, the, the read apps and the WWTs, and that's where we see the folks who have the ability to look at their customer base and hear what they're being asked for, to hear all of the, but I want to run exchange, right? <laughs> what, whatever it is, right? We hear, they get to see all of the, all the complication and then get to call what it is that they need and be as prescriptive or as open as they want to be. Right. And so what the customer ends up getting could be a, you know, could be as, as, as tightly constrained as here's your appliance and here's how much stuff it has in it and here's the software that you use to run it. Or it could be a full on consulting project, but the, the people who we see on the front lines of trying to match those two up from the product side and the customer side are the systems integrators at this point because they're the ones that the customer trusts and they've got more experience with all of that legacy. I mean, they've been selling that hardware to customers for the last 15 years. And they still want to make themselves valuable moving forward. Uh, well, no and, and OpenStack's making it easy for them to be valuable. Right? I mean, when you've got that many projects and when you've got that much stuff to try to keep track of, as, that, as, the, as the funnel starts to widen on what is possible to roll up underneath you know, a certified or a valid OpenStack integration, I think the, I think the partners in the field become even more valuable. They, they are the, um, you know, they're, the, they're getting rid of all of that non-recurring engineering work of trying to figure out what works and which communities are responsive and where are we, where are we seeing development go from the corporate sponsors. You know, let them figure out that work and take care of that for their customers. There's, you know, there's only so much that I as a hardware vendor could ever do of that. All I can do is be willing to work with as many of those teams as possible. You know, and I think there's only so much that we can do from an OpenStack standpoint other than give as much telemetry as possible around what are the projects, what's their status, what's their, um, you know, how reliable are they, what feedback are we getting from the field, those sorts of things yeah. to make the process of culling down you know, what goes into that actual offering to the customer easier. Yeah. But, but I think this is where, you know, why integration engine is, is a theme that's being used pretty often because it applies in multiple faucets. So just like we just talked about, you know, if you have storage rates and you have multiple storage rate types and people want to say, okay, you're supporting this support, this as well. And we go to like, you know, the read apps, the WWTs to kind of do the SI work. Just like you want all 70 drivers in there just so there is a choice available. You sure. need however many projects there are, about, I think about 28 now, <laughs> that, that there's a choice available. If someone wants to go integrate what they need, they can do it. So uh, I actually did a presentation earlier this morning and I had three takeaways from it and one of my take takeaway slides was a Swiss Army knife. Right. And it was basically the fact that OpenStack is applicable to multiple workload types, multiple use cases because it has all these so projects, projects and everything. Absolutely. But because it has these projects, these number of drivers, it makes it very flexible, but flexibility also comes with complexity. Mm -hmm. Those options each have a decision point that you are now yeah. making. And it's not terrible, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a bad problem to have so long as for the 20% of customers who are totally comfortable jumping in and saying, this is the direction I want this project to go because I know what I need out of it. And there are systems integrators or there are kind of that second level, that second to the, even, even the Cisco's, uh -huh. IBM's, those sorts of people who are willing to package together and put together something to say, I'm not going to sell you OpenStack, I'm going to solve your problem. Yes, I don't yes, know that all absolutely. of those, I don't know that having all those pieces is a, is a bad thing. Um, I just think that it makes the process of even just defining what is valid OpenStack a lot more complicated than it was a year ago. Uh, on one hand, I feel like, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of a rock solid infrastructure as a service platform. Um, but I am increasingly seeing customers asking for stuff that's sort of above the stack. Platform as a service. Like most of these folks are not even using infrastructure as a service yet, but, and they don't necessarily want to use platform as a service yet. They just want to know it's there. They want to be able to check a box on an RFP and be like, oh yeah, we got, you know, platform as a service through option X or whatever. I don't care. You know? I sell storage. <laughs> you sell storage. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy way to do it, right? All uh, of the above. <laughs> right. Feel free to use it any way you'd like to. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so look, there's there's stuff that happens below the stack. There's stuff that's happening above the stack. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the intent of core is make sure that the the infrastructure as a service platform is rock solid. On the other hand, I also look at our networking stuff that we've created as a community and all the different options and underlay models and overlay models and acronyms that only networking people can understand. And then I look at AWS and I say, huh, 
they have like two whole networking products or three whole networking products. Like, don't you work for Cisco? At, I do. Isn't that your fault? No. <laughs> <laughs> at, at what point do we do we need? At what point do we focus on ease of use for the developer? Like, at, at what point do we take the focus? back to the developer because I feel like you know a lot of this complexity is being totally. driven by people who've traditionally worked in the data center and on infrastructure. At what point do we focus on the developer experience? Now actually, so it's a great segue because a big push going on in the community right now is we have representation and we have models how to get operator feedback. We're still missing the people who use OpenStack SDKs to write applications. The people who are developing and use consuming OpenStack if you will rather than managing it or building it. And so uh, there's the application ecosystem work group, which was just kicked off. And what they're doing is they're basically doing a hello world example of how to use these various SDKs in Go, Python, et cetera, to consume OpenStack. At the same time, we're looking for, uh, we have another group called the user experience group, which just started as well. And they're looking at, okay, how, what's a workflow that people want? When I, when I make an API request, you know, a good example here is right now with Neutron, again, flexibility and complexity kind of go hand in hand, right? With Neutron, it's almost like it was written by people who know networking for network engineers. It's not meant for someone who's not a network right. person to consume, per se. And that's where I think one of the differences between Amazon comes in, where Amazon, you say, I need an IP, I have a virtual private network, uh, VPC, a uh, virtual private cloud, and I can just go in there, get my address block, and be done with it. Nova Network had that workflow, actually. So Nova Network was just give me an I IP and it would do it, but it was lacking all the different flexibility of, you know, layer three, layer two, different right. controller types, et cetera. And so it's kind of like, and it's happening right now, by the way, uh, is Nova Network is kind of merging workflows with Neutron. But I think, you know, to your point, getting that developer feedback is really critical. And so the community and the foundation are both actively trying to get more OpenStack developers to these conferences and summits to, to get that feedback. I actually, think, I think it's really important that we started the way we did, though. Because, you know, one of the things uh, to, your, to your example, Nikki, is that um, you know, Amazon totally abstracts the data center from all their users. And we're actually talking about people who actually have to build out infrastructure in the data center and figure out how to plug in whatever they, whatever they get in an OpenStack cloud into an, possibly an existing network, possibly existing network tech, um, topologies that are different from, who knows what it is. It's different in every data center, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that there's a bunch of value there where we've kind of hopefully built um, a technology where we're able to be in, uh, to move forward and really just focus on the developer and the usability of the technology um, from the developer perspective instead of how do we get this technology into a data center and make it function and reach the internet. So, I want to take some questions from the audience if you guys have any questions or gals. Or gals. Anything? Questions? Adrian's back there. You got a question? <laughs> Do you guys know Adrian? He's the Magnum guy. Hi, Adrian. Thanks for that, Adrian. Yeah. Thanks for Magnum. It's, it's going to be cool. Well, I, I, I did not use it myself. <laughs> so so thanks, thanks to the 101 contributors that, that made it. So much traction. Who are, who are the companies that are contributing for the most part? Like the, who's leading contributions for Magnum? Uh, well, there are 25, I think, companies who have contributed. So I can only hold about seven things in my memory at once. So I can tell you, of course, I'm from Rackspace. Um, HP is in there. Huawei is in there. Um, IBM is huge in there. So there's, there's a lot of really great contribution going on. And it's not just the big companies that are easy for me to list off, but it's a lot of individual contributors, even that are not affiliated. Who have uh, who've stepped up and picked up features and fixed bugs? It's it's been amazing to okay. see that the the level of excitement around and I've seen more new contributors come through OpenStack Magnum. Like so, I see all of the reviews. Right, I'm always every single day doing reviews on the project, and our CI system in OpenStack does something really cool where when there's a new contributor, it puts a, like a welcome message in. So I know when I review that code that this person has never contributed to OpenStack before and they chose Magnum to do it. And I've seen that maybe 30 or 40 times where it's somebody who's coming in and they're contributing to this. You know, they're, We're growing our community because we're doing things that are new and exciting. And this is just a great feeling. It's good to see there's excitement there in containers. How do you feel about the, uh, the Courier project? 
Uh, we love it. We've been working with that team to, to get the specification really set and the requirements so that it's going to work well with Magnum as well. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know how, what Courier is, you didn't get to see it this morning in the keynotes, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, it's a way to treat uh, Neutron as a Docker remote driver for lib network, which is Docker's way of creating networks. So you can create a network using Docker through the Courier plugin. It's actually going to create a Neutron network on the back end. So you don't have to have multiple networks that are stacked on top of each other. You're going to end up with just one, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And, and at that point, the developer actually gets to control the networking experience. He can right? or she can, yes. Awesome. I see how you got there. <laughs> I was wrong. This is a networking. This is a this container is a talk. <laughs> this is a so, container so talk. When we're talking about you know analysis process, it's interesting because you know going back to the one platform message that's been used, you know, for bare metal containers and, and VMs, even within that message, there's yeah three things that we identified. But in bare metal, we've got multiple options. In VMs, we've got multiple hypervisors and containers. We've got different orchestration systems and even different container standards that you know not all of them are in, in the ecosystem yet. But like so, all of those one platform choices have sub choices as well. And uh, so, again, that's where I think you know, the one platform message really resonates well, but that's where it ties into integration engine as well. So what we want to do is we want people to make a choice to go with OpenStack Cloud, but then know that once you chose OpenStack, as things evolve and the data center evolves and different stacks come above and below, OpenStack is willing to receive and integrate them. It's the constant. It is the constant. Which, which is pretty amazing. And it's neat to see the number of projects that have followed suit in open sourcing their technologies to get community contributions Mm -hmm. to make sure that those things are also constant, which I think is incredible. Yep, absolutely. So all three of you interface with customers, users, community folks. All if you had to give them, you know, if you had to give them one piece of advice about, you know, uh, OpenStack just being this, this big beast and how you deal with that, what, what advice would you give them? When we talk to customers, we really, we start with that 80-20 rule, right? I mean, we, we need to sit down with customers and figure out with them first and foremost, how core to your business is the infrastructure that you run these applications on? And for some customers, it's very important, and they are a different type of OpenStack user, right? Those are the people that we start figuring out how do we align with specific projects? How do we, um, how do we best spend the resource developer calories that you have to spend, and where do we put them, and which vendors do we align behind, that sort of thing. Um, for the rest of them who say the workloads are what matters and the workflows are what matters and the, you know, the, the, the output is what matters, uh, it's about how do, we, how do we leverage all of the goodness that is OpenStack but do it as simply as possible, right? Because for them, the quicker we can do it, the more integrated that looks like, uh, the more supportable, you know, the, the easier that fits into their operational workflows, the bigger win it is. So we spend a lot of time with customers because there are, and it's probably no surprise to anybody, there are lots of customers who feel like they belong in that 20%, who maybe even want to, their staff, uh, people see how exciting it is to belong to one of the, you know, the, the project teams and contribute and um, want to do that, but we need to make sure that that's done in the context of how does this actually integrate in with your business and figuring out what is, what's the right kind of open stack path for you to be able to take there. Um, and once we figure that out, the rest of it honestly follows pretty naturally, right? If you are a, a hard, if you are you cut the twenty percent, um, there's a there's a pretty well lit path for how you get what you need out of it. And if you are the eighty percent, there is an increasingly large number of customers or or partners, systems integrators um, who will come in and be able to solve the problem for you with you know, under uh, OpenStack being kind of that constant down in the middle with with the rest of it around it. So once we figure out what type of OpenStack customer we're talking to, um, it makes the rest of that process and the success of the project itself um, a lot easier. For me, I'm thinking about, you know, does the customer want to just be an OpenStack customer, an OpenStack consumer, or do they actually want to be an OpenStack operator? And I think one of the things that Blue Box has determined to do is to remove the operational overhead for customers, right? So just trying to, the question um, for uh, you know a banking institution of whether or not they want to become cloud experts, whether they want to invest heavily into building out teams of people, infrastructure, data centers, um, to manage, to build cloud expertise, or whether they just need 
to consume cloud that's private and you know in their data center or so in do you see center. value in running a cloud or just simply using it use the cloud and I, I, yeah. use the cloud we have very similar value props in fact some of our language on our respective websites might be exactly the same might so. be i'm sorry <laughs> might be we don't want you don't want to talk about i it. heard jesse from blue box <laughs> Use it, a uh, private cloud just that just works, and I'm like, uh uh, that was on our collateral like eight months ago. I'm not truly, I'm truly not getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he watches this video. Hi, Jesse. We'll, hey, Jesse. We'll sell storage to both of you. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think, you know, starting with the business problem is, is definitely yep. the first thing. And I think, you know, expanding it from OpenStack, I think, start with the business problem, understand, you know, what are you trying to solve and how are you going to solve it. And then once you figure out how you're going to solve it, figure out like, okay, what application architecture is it going to require? And then use the tools that align with that application architecture, align with how often do you need to refresh that, are you doing CI CD? How often are you deploying? Because I mean, most of the keynotes we've seen, for example, when it comes to CI CD type workloads, most people, even on, you know, Lithium on stage, was using Kubernetes, for example. Yep. So like uh, understanding, you know, decomposing from business problem to application architecture, and then taking an application architecture and going, you know what, one size does not fi fit all, I can actually modularize this, mm -hmm. and then picking the right tool for the right part of that application is, is how I would like kind of decompose the overall thing. Amazing stuff, good times. Yep. It's never boring. Never boring. And you know what's cool is once you get OpenStack in an organization, it pretty much spreads like wildfire from what I can tell. And, and I think a lot of that just has to do with the cultural change that OpenStack helps, helps drive, especially in the enterprise. You know, gone are the days of oh, I have to request through a ticket and wait for weeks or days or months to get a resource. That self-service sort of uh, agility that all the folks are seeking, you know, I think that comes in through OpenStack. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a powerful driver for the cultural change in business. And every day it gets better. Every, and every day. day we figure out, collectively we figure out better what are the workloads we're servicing. How is the most efficient way of doing that? You know, how can we be the most productive that we can be with the tools that we have? Um, so it's, uh, it's good, but you know, there's, there's always forward movement, which is more fun. I, I, I wish we could have like a group hug with all 3,900 developers. <laughs> well, we can start right here. I love you guys. <laughs> Competitors and friends all at yeah, the same absolutely. time. I just sell storage. We have three minutes left. Any questions? <laughs> you should need a shirt that says, I just sell storage. That's it. <laughs> Right. I'm the infrastructure guy. <laughs> sure. Uh, you talked about 18 month development cycle and so you talked about 18 month development cycle and you're tracking what goes into those roadmaps. How many people have adopted from the previous versions to, I mean, do you have a distribution? So, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, great question. So basically the question is with the eight month, eight, three release cycle, 18 month, roadmap view, if you will, that we're building, how many people are we seeing move version to version? And I think those are two uh, separate questions. So the roadmap is more forward-facing information of people trying to decide when do I want to move. From a, use, uh, from a data perspective, the user survey actually contains a lot of data about which releases people are using. And generally, I would say, you know, 70% plus are within minus two of the current releases is, is what sure. seems to be a, a, you know, a trend. So it's not a specific release. It's usually within N minus two, you cover about 70% of users. I actually had a question about that for you as well. So I was wondering, you talked about uh, building out this roadmap. I'm really interested in the product working group. But um, you talked about uh, um, building out this roadmap and getting it in front of the eyes of developers, but I didn't understand exactly um, how those things that are on the roadmap in the future are getting action. So it's actually two different things again. So the roadmap we're doing is not building the roadmap, so we're not building the roadmap. What we're doing is we're actually collecting what the roadmap is from the teams and right. just aggregating that information to make it available. What we're doing to input our you know, requirements and, and user feedback into the projects, that's actually the user story side. So we're using user stories to share with the project teams and hopefully uh, working with them right. to identify, so you know. it's the feedback loop. It is. It, okay. it's Communication, go figure it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And actually, uh, Adrian, since you're still here, how, how's that working? out, like as far as the roadmap stuff, like did, did we do a better job this time of collecting the data and what was your perspective as being a PTL in this, you know, funnel and feedback loop of user stories and roadmaps? We have one minute left. Um, in all honesty, mm -hmm. I have more use cases than I can, than I can actually execute on. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see how everyone wants to use OpenStack. Um, and we honestly haven't sorted out exactly what we're going to do in the next release. That's what we're here this week to do. Yep. Um, but it's great to have real data 
and it's great to have folks that are showing up to share with us exactly how they plan to use it. Um, so we'll see. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. If you have uh, additional questions, you can catch us outside or follow us on, on Twitter. The tweets. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.